taking a posture where you can be bright and alert and still relaxed and easeful in your body. So what does that feel like? How does that land? And you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. I'm taking some time to just peruse the body, let the attention move through the body. See if you can soften any points of tension. But also to just really explore, notice sensations. And you can sort of hop from one place to another. What do your arms feel like? What does your face feel like? Can you feel your back? Your stomach? Your legs, your feet? when we just tune into these sensations it can be so striking and actually interesting even how much is going on in our body all the time and to realize that this is our life often overlooked. And letting the awareness just be with the body gives us this refuge, this place of stillness. Of nowness. Can have maybe at least a few moments of feeling like we don't need anything else but to be alive, to be present to feel. Being aware of sounds, sensations, feelings, emotional feelings, well, these subtle experiences. And letting the attention come to rest on the breath. So 
feeling the breath either at the nostrils, the touch of air coming in and out, or in the belly, the movement rising and falling. And there's still a sense of being in your body, but letting that focus be more specific on the breath. When you notice the mind has wandered from the breath, just acknowledging that and coming back, reconnecting.
just being with the changing sensations, the changing thoughts, the, the flow of experience. With mindfulness, it's not so much that we're trying to stop the world, but rather to watch it passing by. Besides trying to be aware when the mind wanders, it's also really helpful to track your energy, whether you're getting too relaxed or you're getting restless. Just following that, we try to keep our energy balanced, but can't necessarily control that. So 
you just bring a mindfulness and that includes an openness, a kind of acceptance to your energetic state. And that helps you to maintain continuity of attention as well. It seems like, I don't know how you guys feel, but it's like we're getting used to meditating together on Zoom. At first, it seemed kind of ridiculous in a way, like meditating, like there's other faces there, but my eyes are closed. So what's the point? Um, but yeah, there's something about doing it together that um, intensifies the experience, I think. Um, so it's nice to have us together. Um, I got notes, which are on my computer. So um, so I'm in the part of the book um, in step five called Rigorous Honesty, which is on page 122 for those who are following along. And, um, you know, obviously I, I took that line from the Alcoholics Anonymous big book. Uh, maybe it's not obvious if you if you're not familiar with the 
big book. It's not obvious at all. Uh, says that they are people who uh, cannot um, how to get sober through the program. Uh, it says they are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. And and when I I typed that up, what occurred to me about that statement and about that passage in the big book is that it's kind of saying, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you can't find anything wrong with this program. If you're, if you're not working for you, it's totally your fault, you know? So I think that's, um, you know, that's been one of the problems with the 12 step uh, world, kind of a, 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 you know, take it or leave it attitude. Uh, a somewhat inflexible attitude or or judge even judgmental attitude that if you're if you're not if you're relapsing uh, it couldn't be that there's something lacking in the program or or that you uh, you might need something else other than this you know this is um, all you should ever need and and we know like for some people yeah it's fine uh, 12 steps is enough, but, um, you know, not necessarily for everybody. Um, so, and, you know, it's, it's sort of this claim, like, uh, this is, this is why, you know, uh, and I don't know, uh, and non nonetheless, the phrase itself and what it's pointing to is really important, right? I mean, honesty is sort of, at the heart of recovery, it's the it's the beginning of recovery, being honest and coming out of denial around your addiction, and and to maintain recovery, uh, certainly the inventory process and the amends process all really demand honesty. So it's it is a good guide guideline. Just not, I just don't want to say that it's you know the uh, cause that, that the lack of that is the cause of anybody's the, the sole cause of a relapse so i thought i would start by well, going now just reading the first paragraph of this section when i was young i thought of myself as incredibly honest because upon meeting someone i would launch into horror stories about myself and my family well, young by young, I mean, <laughs> I guess somewhere between like 20 and somewhere. Uh, I'd brag that I'd started in therapy at 14, <laughs> that my depression had driven my parents to put me in a private mental hospital at 18, that my mother had had a nervous breakdown, that my brothers had dropped out of the best colleges, <laughs> that the whole family drank to excess, and that I'd been arrested for drug possession. All of this wasn't honesty, just bravado. I knew nothing about true honesty, about exposing myself on an intimate emotional level, and more important about investigating and coming to understand myself, my motivations and my destructive impulses. The first time I went to a 12 step meeting before I actually got sober, I got a glimpse of what honesty meant. So um, I will talk more about that first meeting, but um, yeah, th this was a real, really important revelation for me. Uh, and, and it actually goes along with another revelation, which is the revelation that not only was I not honest, but that I didn't know how to feel. Um, and, and those two probably go together in some way. Uh, but, um, but yeah, this sort of bravado of kind of like, oh my, you know, I have such a screwed up family. It, isn't it romantic? You know, like I was some Salinger character or something, you know, um, it's just sort of, and it, and it is typical, I think of an alcoholic or an addict, this uh, like, oh, you know, I'm so depressed. My life is, oh, you know, it, and just sort of 
making ourselves into this sort of drama person, the drama royal, royalty. <laughs> uh, that was so that I didn't have to be a drama king or a drama queen. It was like trying to keep it anyway, trying to stay gender neutral with my royalty. But really, my intention is to sh share things that I think maybe not universal, but that people can relate to in some way. So uh, I'm not just telling these stories for entertainment purposes, um, but that uh, this was part of like creating an identity, right? And that and this crippling identity, this, this identity that, uh, you know, boxed me in to being this person with this certain sort of dramatic family and, and dramatic experiences that ultimately were really limiting to who I could be. And so that's what I think is very, like, I don't know, universal, but somewhat universal in the addict world that we, we create these identities. That's who we are. And that's one of the reasons why it's so hard for us to get sober and to say, oh, that identity was crap, really. You know, it was, uh, it wasn't true, but, but further it was, um, it wasn't worth being invested in, you know, right? Like, there's just nothing that cool about being an addict. And, and yet, again, we kind of try to make it something cool. And, you know, you see this in the music world, of course, that I lived in. And when I, you know, I listen to different, you know, I've been listening a lot to Kind of Blue and, and like watched a, a documentary about it and the, the Miles Davis, probably the greatest album in of any music ever I mean the most perfect and just kind of going through these characters in this band you know Coltrane and Bill Evans and these guys that you know were addicts and, and died young and, and and that you know that is an identity that jazz musicians would strive for like right if I'm going to play like Bird I need to shoot heroin that kind of foolishness that people fall into and you know I, I mean a part of it is an understandable reaction to the fact that the world is a really messed up place you know and it, it is really hard to just be an adult and and live with the reality of what what this world is um, you know particularly if you're like a a, a black musician, you know, in the 1950s or the 2020s, you know, the, uh, but uh, so, I, you know, I think what, one of the ways of like dealing with despair is to make it a drama, you know, not, I may be digressing too much here, but um, anyway, uh, it just hits me that, that that's, as, as so many of our, uh, addictive behaviors are is a a protective mechanism in a certain way having this story uh, uh, to protect us from the, what we're not able to to live with and to or to like understand in some way um so so I'll talk a little bit about, and, and this is more storytelling, this first meeting that I went to, and I don't know how many people had experiences like this, like, you know, you get sober and, or before you get sober, you get exposed to the program. That 
I, you know, a friend, I was like supporting a friend, you know, like supporting a friend, right? Oh, she needs to go to a cocaine anonymous program, you know, I'll go with her, you know. And, uh, you know, it was in West Hollywood. Uh, so if you've ever been in meetings in West Hollywood, they are fun. <laughs> they are hella fun. And, uh, you know, and I had no idea what I was getting into. But, uh, you know, we come up the steps into this room and it's this big room packed with chairs and just people are yakking or yapping or whatever, chatting up. It's just, it's just a dull roar, you know, and then, then the meeting starts and, you know, here I am like thinking I'm a Buddhist. You know, like this is like, I'm a Buddhist, but I'm not sober, right? In this part of my story. And I'm sitting there and I'm like gonna meditate, right? Because it's like, it's a spiritual thing. We're going to meditate, right? But it's like, it's not meditation. It's people getting up and getting coffee and eating cookies and, you know, the secretary getting the meeting going. And uh, and so my, I'm thinking, well, these people aren't very spiritual. You know, they're so, they're so loud, you know, which is like another one of those like delusions, right? And it's like a Buddhist, particularly B Buddhist delusion that like silence is spiritual, <laughs> like talking, that's not spiritual. <laughs> anyway you know what looking back on that and what i talk about in the book is how you know i hear this story i'll, I'll read the, this part when the main speaker begins to tell his story i find myself laughing along the outrageous behavior and confused thinking he describes from his years of using is familiar to me very familiar i smile and nod knowingly Somehow the fact that I'm relating so closely to the story of a coke addict gets past me. I don't realize that the reason this all sounds so familiar is that I am an alcoholic and addict too. Duh. <laughs> but I am impressed, impressed with the incredible honesty and lack of pretense of someone who can get up in front of a couple hundred people and expose himself in this way. I can't imagine doing that. So that in itself, I mean, that was a good thing to see uh, for me because it was like, oh, this is what a, like I mean, cocaine anonymous, alcoholics anonymous, all pretty much the same to me, but this is what a, a meeting is like, you know, uh, it's not at all like the image of it. So I sort of had this very positive image of what it could be. Um, You know, I mean, in a way, it's consoling. This is how we, this is how we, um, I guess I say comfort each other, how we relate to each other is hearing each other's stories and, and relating and, and uh, I'm just adjusting my camera here a little. Um, That, uh, that tradition of sharing and telling stories um, is what, you know, it's what connects us all and, and allows us to not feel alone. And that's, that's what's so essential to recovery. And I don't know if I'm gonna get to this. I, th I think I will tonight. Um, uh, well, yeah, uh, let, let me work through this a little bit more. Looking back, I see how in meditation, it was possible to deceive myself. In silence, in my own mind, what appeared and disappeared was not seen or heard by anyone else. I got no feedback, and besides that, I didn't recognize the, quote, nature of my wrongs. The destructive and dysfunctional quality of my thinking, not to mention my behavior. This is where the 12 steps have something to offer to Buddhism. So that I think is, you know, one of the, you know, key things for me that, you know, I, people who maybe aren't familiar with what I'm, my work or maybe are, but uh, don't see that I'm doing this, don't realize that in my mind, I'm not just trying to get 12 step people into Buddhism. I'm also trying to get Buddhists 
into the 12 steps and not necessarily specifically like, oh, you should go to a program, but for them to see the parts of the 12 steps that are so valuable that are really missing from the, from the Buddhist world. You know, and I talk here then about the monasteries in Asia and how that's more of a sort of social center that we don't have that um, in, in the West. But it's, it's more than that, you know, I mean, I mean, I, uh, you know, when I tr when I talk about this and I think about it, I realize that there is this big limitation. Like when Buddha, when a bunch of people come to a Buddhist group, just a straight Buddhist group, if you will, uh, if I can use the word straight, I don't know what that even means, but but that's not a recovery group. Huh? That's what I mean. Um, They're, what they are sharing is an interest presumably in Buddhism or in meditation or in some kind of spiritual experience. But I don't think that sharing something like that makes you feel particularly open to the people that are around you. You, you don't necessarily trust them and and so uh, i guess this is one of my recurring themes and many of you have heard me talk about this but you know that's what happens when i am here twice a week every week say the same stuff over and over that you know you when you come into a buddhist group and you just sit and you, you listen to a talk and you go home there's no real connection being made uh, and you know and that's not to say people don't connect in those situations but just in a sort of generic way there isn't something that bound binds us together you know? uh, whereas there is in recovery right and it's i mean maybe what binds us together first of all is just the idea that it's our shared responsibility to take care of each other which is built into the program, right? Step 12 is, that's what it's saying. It's, you know, having had a spiritual awakening, we try to carry this message to others. So it's not that we're just carrying it out the meeting, we're carrying it in the meeting and, and around the meeting. And there, you know, it's that uh, sense of all being um, out there together you know, uh, and that there's nobody else who's going to take care of us but us. <coughs> and, and so we take care of each other, right? And, and that's, that's it, you know, taking care of each other. That's what spiritual community is about. You know, and the, so, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know, to, to sort of keep harping on this as though there's something wrong with the Buddhist world, but um, it's harder to get, to get um, people in the Buddhist world to kind of think in the same way. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll stop. Um, I, I, I'll read a little bit more because there's just a little bit more in this chapter and so, or in this section. Um, I'm sort of characterizing the, uh, again, kind of the difference between the Buddhist community and the recovery community. But uh, here, um, it may also be that Buddhists in the West, being a self-selecting bunch, tend toward introversion, or introversion, sorry. After all, who wants to sit around silently all day but an introvert? Uh, so I do think that's part of it, you know, that the Buddhist world is like the people who show up at Buddhist groups, like aren't really, don't really want to talk to anybody. I mean, there may be some of that, right? But, uh, so. uh, and, and then this other, I guess that's what a lot, a lot of this section is about is sort of the, this um, contrast. And then I talk about how there is this increasing effort to kind of 
create communities in the Buddhist world. There's Kalyanamita groups, which are spiritual friends. And, and you know, you have, you know, if you go to uh, various different communities, they'll maybe have a, a book club kind of thing or a movie night or a hiking. So I, I'm seeing much more of that than there was when I started to practice. Uh, but, you know, things change. So apparently things have changed, which is good. Um, but here again, I'm kind of contrasting. Uh, so what's difficult to achieve is the kind of support that those in 12 step groups give each other. This may be, cut, be because of a central difference in orientation between 12 step groups and Buddhist groups and the 12 step groups, what brings people together is a common affliction uh, the p members of these groups share a struggle and also willingness to engage that struggle with tremendous honesty. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that, that's the other piece. There, there is this power to this honesty. You know, it's so interesting that when we say, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, you know, that... Um, that has this power that saying I'm a Buddhist doesn't quite have. Uh, I mean, it could. In contrast, a Buddhist group is filled with people who in some sense are striving for Buddhahood or perfection. So kind of contrasting that sort of saying it's almost the opposite, right? The, the image of a Buddhist, the, I mean, if you just say like, a, if you just say like, I'm a Buddhist, people think, Oh, you're somebody who's like serene. You never get angry. You know, meditate all the time, right? Chant mantras, maybe. Then if you say, I'm an alcoholic, they think, oh, you're like a drunk who's like vomiting on the floor and, you know, uh, crashing your car, right? So, so um, you know, it looks like we're very different. Yeah. So, you know, the next section of the book is, is meant to kind of balance this out. So we'll get to that next week, Noble Friends and Noble Conversation. And, and I think I will bring in some things from uh, Living Kindness at that point. But uh, so uh, a little odd being away from home and staying in a motel uh, for five days. We just got to look at our new freshly painted house. It looks beautiful. So, uh, but I kept my office the exact same color. So unfortunately, because some of the other parts of the house look really like, oh, like you guys been, would have been like, oh, wow, it looks different. <laughs> just gonna be like, I don't know what you spent all that money to do it. Uh, I know, fascinating. So um, there's time. Someone say something. It doesn't have to even be intelligent. Uh, I was going to say something intelligent, but then I realized it doesn't. Um, I have something to say. Hi. Um, I was just thinking that, um, you know, be, being an alcoholic and addict, you know, particularly when we come in or, or another, you know, um, it's more immediate. It's more, yeah. in many cases, desperate. And yeah. even though we're to reflect on that we're all, a, we're all going to die. We're all going to lose things we love. We're all going to get sick unless we're dealing with those things. It's, it's just, it's more abstract in a way. Yep. And um, yeah. Um, oh, uh, exactly. And, and I find that really interesting how, how Buddhists tend to keep it so abstract. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was on a, in a, a session with this, some spirit rock teachers yesterday uh, with a diversity trainer, basically someone who we've been working with. And, and most of the conversation was about language. And, and there were, you know, it's very interesting. It's, it's always really an interesting conversation about how, how we use language in our, in, Kind of Buddhist communities and 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 the and the language that people object to and have difficulty with and all that, but 
afterwards I was doing a lot of thinking about how like there's kind of this there's this language that's harmful you know mm-hmm. whether you know like microaggression or whether it's you know racist language that is sort of like unconscious bias these kinds of things that are that are harmful that that teachers you know teachers being human say things and you know and we, hopefully we get feedback and someone lets us know like that that wasn't okay but then there's this adjacent what i think of as adjacent language that might disturb people but i don't think it's harmful and i think that sometimes buddhist teachers get these two mixed up and feel that they shouldn't say anything that would disturb somebody like everybody's going to die all of you guys and me we're all going to die like no no like that's going to upset it. you know i was actually told by someone once i gave a talk and and this was years ago and i don't remember if it was about death but death was part of the talk uh and someone came up to me afterwards and said you really shouldn't talk about death because there might be somebody here who's dying and i thought hmm interesting is there somebody here who isn't dying like what did i miss something you know and and so yeah uh I really, you know, think it's important to not soften the teachings up too much. Uh, not that I'm going to try to like get people upset, but it's interesting because re- you're familiar with RAIN. So some of you may know this acronym, yeah, which was developed originally, I think came from Michelle McDonald, who's an IMS teacher, Insight Meditation Society. And it, meant recognize, accept, or allow, investigate, and non-identify. And it was this process. And really, if when you take it apart, it's actually just a deconstruction of mindfulness. It, with mindfulness, we recognize things and then we accept them. Like just seeing them isn't enough, right? We recognize and we see, we accept them. So there's not a reactivity. That's the non-reactive part. There's investigation which is the looking very closely and, and observing the whole kind of process and then non-identifying. Well, some teachers have decided that I don't, for whatever reason, that they should change non-identify to nurture. nurture. And to me, you just threw out <laughs> the core teaching of Buddhism in favor of trying to make people feel good, you know? Like, okay, now nurture yourself. Like, yes, of course, nurture. But to me, a lot acceptance is nurturing. You know, so I, I feel like that's already in there. And when you throw out non-identify, it's, you're losing this like key idea. And, uh, and I, again, I'm not like opposed to nurturing. I, I, it's vital to, for us to nurture ourselves. But in terms of like mindfulness, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, recognize, accept, investigate, not identify is kind of a, a process that really gets you towards insight. Mm-hmm. Whereas ending it with nurture just gets you towards comfort. So, yeah. um, so, you want to push back? I, well, I, the, no, I mean, I agree. Oh. I, I think um, having done it both ways, well, okay, forget it. Having done it both, well, like I learned rain with the non-identify a long yeah. time ago. Mm-hmm. And then Tara, you know, I learned the nurture part. And um, some of it was that a lot of, maybe I'm just making this up and I, or, but that people okay. didn't understand what non-identify. Okay. <laughs> I know, and right. What's my job title? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, yeah. yeah. So there's this softening going on, yeah. especially well with mindfulness in the last 10 years. I yeah. Mean, yeah. So, I mean, I was trying to connect this with. With the, the immediacy of addiction. Right. That was the whole point. Yeah. There's no softening in that. It's like, no. you're fucked up, get your shit together. Kind of, you know, yeah. and, and if you don't, 
you're going to bear the karmic price. You know, there's no like nurturing to get around it. You know, uh, I realize I'm being tough now and I hope I'm not offending anybody. But also nurturing, yeah, is very important. Nurturing, which is what the 12 steps lacks, actually, in my mind. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's fair. That's fair. That's good. Thank mm -hmm. you, Anne. Yeah. All right. Now you've given me some work to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Do the, the 12 steps lack? Jim agrees with you. I saw him nodding. So yeah. I'm keeping an eye on you, Jim, because you're a good feedback person for me. Thank you. It's an interesting thought. The 12 steps lack nurturing. Mm -hmm. they have god step three the care of god what could be more nurturing than that mm. oh it's very young it's external it's very That's young right. Ooh. unless you are god and we are anyway wow okay no that's, uh, that's i think you're right that it's it, it's the word care is definitely underemphasized in that step. It's, it's not a word that people often re, even remember is in step three. Uh, so, the care, yes. so yeah, it's, it's not, it definitely needs to be strengthened. Yeah. Maybe because God is just, I grew up, it's so male and that's yeah. Yeah. outside of myself. It's this amorphous thing Yeah. out there. Well, but you, you may have heard me say you can substitute, like there's a saying, God is love. So you could say, I turn my will and my life over to the care of love. Love. Right. The higher power of love. Yeah. That's yeah. a great chapter in that book. Oh, well. <laughs> poo poo. It is. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Enough of me. <laughs> well. <laughs> You're willing to talk. I don't see anybody else jumping in. Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Deb, hi. I might have been on a different page. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm an alcoholic. And um, very much into mindfulness as well. Yes. Um, some, just as you talked about earlier, um, you know, just the differences between, you know, Buddhism and, and then the 12 steps and what each has to offer to us and what overlaps and what doesn't. And um, I've come across this feeling or this thought um, along the way that um, because I, I practice um, insight meditation before I got clean and sober as well, mm -hmm. but it was coming from a place of deep, deep wonderment and why am I here and what's going on and what's, you know, oh, you know, angst, you know, and that's what got me into contemplative practice. Mm -hmm. And even though it did benefit my life a lot, I still didn't know during that time that I was a, a budding alcoholic <laughs> in the sense of using, um, I believe I was born an alcoholic, you know, um, uh -huh. right. part of my genetics, either way, along the way, you know, found the 12 steps, which was super beneficial and which I still participate in 12 step programs as well as, as Dharma. And um, I kind of see Dharma as, um, I almost want to say like, if you're sick or something, or if I have a headache, um, go take an aspirin. Mm -hmm. But if my headaches, because I have diabetes, the aspirin is not going to really fully relieve the symptoms of the disease of the diabetes. I've got to go for the specificity of that medication for that issue. And so I see um, the 12 steps as the specific medicine for this specific disease of alcoholism that offers things you know, to us because of how the way, how our brain and mind and emotions work. And yeah. then I see Dharma recovery as just as, this more expansive thing that even opens us up to more and i love the how the two can hold the hands but we need the specificity of both you know the specificity of the 12-step program i feel has benefited me so much um in that way and i never want to forget that you know i don't want to substitute and say well i've got my my insight meditation practice down and I feel good and I can depend on my sobriety because I believe in the precepts and I'll carry on my life that way. I've tried that before. 
So I need to keep both, both, yeah. you know, yeah. healing processes going. Anyway, I just wanted to share that because yeah. it's a good that's one. great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks Deb. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, it's funny that I seem like I'm kind of critiquing Buddhism or Western Buddhism or something. And of course, it's you know one of my great passions. It is, it is probably my greatest passion and the thing that I rely on the most. Um, yeah, and and I agree. I think the, the the point you're making that like for addiction, Buddhism is not an addiction recovery program. And it really supports it. It really supports a, a, an addiction recovery program, but it isn't specifically for that condition. And and we have to treat that condition first. If not, then we can't do do much Buddhism. You know, the Buddhism isn't doesn't have much impact. So we're uh, just about out of time. I mean, we officially we're out of time, but I did want to just comment on the. I uh, appreciate Julie putting in. We uh, we love you until you can love yourself. Comment in the rooms of OA. Very nurturing does not mean we stop loving you when you can indeed love yourself. So that's, uh, so there is, that's the argument that there's nurturing. So, uh, but fair, fair, fair enough, not that we're arguing, we're just all supporting each other. So thanks Julie for putting that in there, reminder. Uh, no doubt we all, or in whatever form it comes, we need nurturing. Ah, and what a time, what a time to live through. It feels like a time to live through, just to get through this time. Um, so I won't I won't go into my story uh, right now, further into this moment. But uh, just that I mean I, I'm sure you we all share this kind of uh, borderline despair at times. <laughs> That like, oh, Thanksgiving, like, forget it, you know. Um, what do you want for Christmas? Like, I want them to cancel Christmas for Christmas, you know, please. Um, just uh, tough. Um, my mood is not the greatest. Uh, but uh, seeing you guys and being together and sitting and talking Dharma and recovery is definitely one of the best parts of this time. That and maybe like a perfectly struck six iron from the middle of the fairway, you know, landing a foot from the flag. And a couple of things. So you guys, um, uh, we're moving from uh, Scorpio into Sagittarius this weekend. Uh, I used to care about astrology, but uh, <laughs> November 20th, right? So uh, next week, uh, Tuesday morning, I'll be uh, on Zoom, God willing. Blessings, guys.